Remember what it was like when you were stopped by a police officer for a moving violation? The flashing lights alone were humiliating. Then thoughts raced through your mind as to how you could get out of it. You had the wrong person. Or, yes, I did it, but it was really the other driver's fault. But if you insist, please, will you give me a warning ticket? You were thinking about your insurance rate going up, the cost of the fine, and so forth. Pastor Brooks begins a most interesting sermon today entitled, Capricious Grace. Call a friend to tune in as we listen to this most unusual but inspiring message. What about under the law, but not under grace? That's tonight's subject. Just wait on it, please. The Ten Commandments, Pastor, says that thou shalt not kill. Please explain, explain why the Israelites were allowed to kill all the people in the Promised Land. I know God is a just God. How can I explain to my children why God permitted them to be killed? Did they deserve to live? In the first place, there was a theocracy at this time. God was in charge, and I don't question whatever God wants to do. Would you say amen to that? Now, there are many who stumble over that. The commandments say, thou shalt not kill. And yet Israel was told to wipe out certain people who had gone before God in judgment. And now the judgment of God was to be executed upon them. And in order to establish respect for his people, God gave them victory in battle. There's one text that might help you. I know it helped me when I found it. It's Jeremiah 51 and verse 20. There God said of Israel, you are my battle axe. I will use you to destroy wicked nations. And the fear of Israel spread throughout the land, and the fear of God. And so God chose this course, and he was in charge, and they were used as executioners in God's system of judgment. Please, Pastor, tell me, where was Satan when God made this world nation week? I don't know exactly. He was somewhere. There was a time when he was in heaven, he was kicked out and could no longer go up there and not until Christ died was he barred from visiting other planets. That's why Revelation 12 says, after the death of our Lord, therefore rejoice ye heavens, plural, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Only now is he circumscribed. Before then, he went around trying to spread his filth amongst the stars. You get an indication of that in Job chapter 1, verse 1 and on. Next, please. Pastor Brooks, is it possible to be a Christian without being a member of a particular religion or group? Well, you can't be a Christian without being a member of a particular religion because Christianity is a religion. And then why would you want to be? I was recently asked by a lady whom I'd never seen. If I would baptize her, a Caucasian lady, she came to our church, and I said, why, of course we'll do it. And when we got down to it, she wanted to be baptized but didn't want to join the church. I said, I don't know how to do that. Baptism is the door to the Lord's church. Would you say amen out there? And now, why would a person want to be baptized and not belong to the Lord's church when he said he's coming for a church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing? The Lord has a church. And it ought to be a pleasure, and it is a pleasure, to belong to it. Are we going to grow old and have babies when we get to heaven? <laughs> one, day, one day, the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, came to Jesus, and they wanted to know, suppose a man marries a lady and he dies, and then she marries his brother and he dies, until seven brothers marry the same woman. When they get to heaven, whose wife is she going to be? Find this in Matthew chapter 22. And Jesus said in verse 29, You do err not knowing the scriptures. For in heaven there will neither be marriage nor given in marriage. But we're going to be like the angels. Now please don't think I'm being facetious when I say the main thing to do is to make sure you get to heaven. <laughs> don't, don't worry about all that. There's one thing I know. David said that when I awake I shall be satisfied. Whatever God's plan is, it's going to be better than hell, and hell's going to be down here. Pastor, you mean New Testament Christians are supposed to keep old Moses' law? It never fails. People refer to Moses as old Moses, as though he were a bad fella. Does anyone know where Moses is tonight? He's where? You're trying to get where Moses is. Would you say amen out there? 
Now, Jesus quoted Moses. And Jesus said, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me. You want to read that? Find John 5, 46 and 47. But Jesus said, how can you believe me if you didn't believe him? This idea of dispensations is man-made. And this idea that you're not supposed to believe the Old Testament is utterly ridiculous. When Jesus was here, there was only one testament, and that was the Old. The first book of the New Testament was written 22 years, about 22 years, after the ascension, and it was the book of Mark. So if you believe the scriptures at all, when Christ was here, that's all you had, and it was good enough for him. The Bible says he began with Moses and all the prophets and explained unto the people the things the scripture said concerning himself. That was on the road to Emmaus. Next, please. Sir, is it a sin for a woman to put on pants? Please explain Deuteronomy 22, 5. Uh, we often get this text. Deuteronomy 22, 5 says that a woman shouldn't wear that which pertaineth to a man, neither should a man put on a woman's garment. Whoever does it is an abomination unto the Lord. And there are some who feel that if a lady puts on slacks, she is committing a sin. In the first place, I don't believe that. In the days when this was written, neither men nor women wore pants. They all wore robes. Would somebody say amen? amen? And so what God has always been interested in is that you be able to di distinguish between the sexes. God has always, both Old and New Testament, thoroughly condemned homosexuality and the gay lifestyle. And God does not approve of men trying to be women, nor women trying to be men. Now when it comes to uh, our culture, there are places where it's inappropriate to wear pants. When you come to worship, it's better. And if you have on pants tonight, you're just as welcome as you can be. But it's better to wear something else, to be a little more uh, formal when you worship God. But if you're going to ride a bicycle, I want to tell you, pants beat skirts. And if you're going to climb a mountain, you need pants on, especially if there's a man coming up after you. Pastor, we have been told that if we have the Holy Ghost, we don't need to obey the law. Please explain. I hope you heard that. We preached on God's law last night. And someone says we've been told that if you had the Holy Ghost, you don't need uh, to obey the law. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I had time to read all of this to you, but I want you to listen to this. I'm reading from the book of Acts chapter 5, and I'm reading verse 32. This is the word of God. Listen, please. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. Is that clear? To whom is the Holy Ghost given? You can't even have the Holy Ghost without obedience, or at least a willingness to obey. Next, please. Pastor, in last night's sermon, you said God's law existed in heaven before creation and that God's law is the Ten Commandments. Since the Fourth and Fifth Commandments seem to relate strictly to mankind, as does most of the others as well, how would you state God's law in heaven before creation? Somebody's very provocative and profound in their thinking. I, I think all you have to do is adapt it to the culture of heaven. When the Bible says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill others. There was war in heaven, and Satan would have killed if he could have. All of these things applied on a particular plane to whatever culture God was addressing. When the law was given to man, it pertained especially to man's relationship with God, the first four commandments, and man's relationship with his fellow man, the last six. Most preachers just take one text and close the Bibles and talk about an hour. Why do you move around in the Bible so much? <laughs> well, let me find it. Now, you give me a moment. I think I can. Uh, I, I got it. Somebody said most preachers take one text, close their Bible, and talk for about an hour. Why do you move around in the Bible so much? I think it's a question of whether you want to hear most from man or from God. Do you want to hear what God says? In the first place, the Bible does not contradict itself. The Bible is inspired by one Holy Spirit. There's no reason for him to contradict himself. And so if it appears to be a contradiction, the problem is not with the Bible, but with your understanding of it. Now let me read to you from chapter 28 of Isaiah, verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? 
And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Verse 10, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Would you say amen out there? Church, don't ever worry if I move around in the Bible. It's when I start moving out of it that you ought to be concerned. What do you say? It's all the Word of God. joy. Thank you so much. Our message tonight is capricious grace. Capricious grace. And I'm going to try to talk fast. Tonight we're talking about the Ten Commandments again. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the Ten Commandments are God's standard of righteousness and grace. 
Grace is the power to reach that standard. I don't know how I can do better than that. The Ten Commandments show God's ideal and grace is the ladder by which we climb up to that ideal. The Bible says in Romans 4 and verse 15, where no law is, there is no transgression. I hope you get that. If you do away with God's law, you do away with sin. For sin is the transgression of the law. And if there is no law, the Bible says, there is no sin. Satan hates God's law. You want to know why? Because if men and women would observe God's commandments, they would stop lying, stop stealing, stop committing adultery. They would be good people everywhere. They would dress decently. The liquor business would go out of business. Prostitutes would clean themselves up. If everybody obeyed God's law, this would be an ideal place in which to live. That's why Satan hates God's law. And then, brothers and sisters, when we think of the enormity of sin, when we understand the rupture that occurred between relationships, when Adam's sin trauma struck the earth, and heaven went into shock. Nothing like that had happened down here. And it had happened in glory. And here again, God has to meet a crisis. The Bible tells us that God came down, met with Adam and Eve, and made a promise based not on what they deserved, but on grace. Genesis 3.15 I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Here is the promise of a Savior. Adam and Eve had disobeyed. Disobedience is sin. Because of sin, somebody had to die. And God promises to let his son come and die. And in token of that, he selected two kids. And their throats were cut and blood poured out. There is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And if you think about it, when these animals died, that was the first time even God had seen bloodshed. And it was to dramatize the fact that the Lamb of God would come eventually and pour out His blood for, from, uh, or for mankind so that we might be saved from sin. After this occurred, Adam and Eve were barred from the tree of life, lest they become immortal sinners. They were driven out of the Garden of Eden along the avenue of shame, and there was a long, bitter wail, a cry of agony that reached all the way to Calvary. Why did Jesus have to die? If I would ask you personally why Christ had to die, you would answer, because of sin. If the law of God could have been changed or abrogated, Jesus would not have had to die. For where there is no law, there is no sin. The easiest thing to do would have been to change the law. Then Christ wouldn't have to die and Adam and Eve could be exonerated. But Jesus would not change his own law to save his own life. God must not only be a merciful God, he has to be a just God with respect for law and order. And the Bible says in Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. Ladies and gentlemen, some are suggesting that Jesus died to save man from sin and yet they say there is no law it doesn't matter since he died and gave us grace no need to worry no need to worry about keeping the law if you don't keep it you're sinning and a man cannot be saved in his sins now the text that you always hear when people say we're not under the law but under grace is Romans 6, 18, 6, 14, I'm sorry. There the Apostle Paul is talking to church members. 
He's talking to those who have repented and are saved by grace. And he says to them, we are not under the law, but under grace. I want to tell you that's one of my favorite texts. Everybody in here who loves the Lord, every sinner who is being saved by grace, ought to thank God for that text. We are not under the law, but under grace. I have no problem with the text. The problem is the misapplication of it. So let's define a word. The word grace means unmerited favor. What did I say? That means pardon which you don't deserve. If you deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. It would be justice. And it's so in our courts today. If someone is indicted for a crime he did not commit, and the judge says to him when it's proved he didn't commit it, the judge says, I'm going to let you go. He's not giving him grace. He's giving him what he deserves. But if the man deserves to, to spend money or spend time in jail and the judge lets him go, that is undeserved mercy. That's grace. Now if we understand what grace is, unmerited favor, the boundless love of God, as a matter of fact, someone said, Jesus Christ himself is grace. If we could understand that it's something given from God which we don't deserve, then we are on our way to understanding this message tonight. But grace does not obviate truth. Grace does not do away with the word of God. Let me prove it, and I hope you're writing these down. In Proverbs 3 and verse 3, the Bible says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Mercy, grace, and truth. And the Bible says all his commandments are truth. Would you say amen out there? Amen. Don't take just one and run off with it. You need mercy and truth. Another text is Proverbs 16, 6. It says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't like to hurry, but that's what I'm doing. I want to tell you something, and I'm going to be very candid with you. I had an experience in my life that makes this subject clearer than anything I've been able to think of since. And because that is true, I'm going to tell you a true story again. In fact, I want it on video. Several years ago, I was preaching in Norfolk, Virginia. And sometimes when you sit in one office and, and make out appointments, you don't really realize that you're squeezing yourself too tightly. And as it turned out, I was to end my week of services on Saturday, and that same afternoon, I was to preach in a large church in Maryland at 4 o'clock. And when I began to realize it, I told the host pastor, when that service is finished, I don't have time to shake hands. I don't want anybody blocking my car. I got to get on the highway and I've got to make that appointment in Maryland four hours away. Now I knew that I had to rush. And so we finished the service. The pastor had explained it. The people just stood up and waved goodbye. And few deacons escorted me to my car, got me out, and I'm on my way. Except I got lost. It seemed like every street I turned down was a dead end. Finally, I got on the highway. And I want to tell you, I did not intend to speak. But I suppose it was all hidden in the subconscious, and I was rolling. When all of a sudden, sitting in the middle of the highway, behind a great big rock, I saw one of those tan-colored Fords with a hornet's nest on top. You know what I mean, don't you? When I saw the state trooper in Virginia, I looked down and I was doing 81 miles an hour. And I thought to myself, no need for me to let him stop me. I might as well pull on over. So I did. And he came out and went past me. And for a moment, I thought I was getting away. But instead, he stopped the car in front of me and then stood in the middle of the highway with both arms up waiting on me. And when I got there, he did like that. At that moment, I was under the law. 
Now don't miss this. I didn't want to fool with him. Wasting my time. But it's inconvenient when you're under the so I pulled over. Now, now here's the humiliation. In my rush, there was a little old car with five or six young people in it, and they were in the way. And I rolled up behind them, and I blew my horn. Beep, 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 beep. And they got over and looked at me, and I just went on. And about the time that policeman stopped me and I got out, here they come. <laughs> and they looked at me and blew their horn. Beep, 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 beep. I was embarrassed. It is embarrassing when you are under the and Now I stood there, and that policeman started with that first car. And instead of that man sort of buttering that policeman up, he began to argue with him. And I thought to myself, why does he have to make that man angry? <laughs> he got out of his car, and they were in each other's face. And finally that policeman turned his back pulled out a ticket book, wrote the man a ticket, and he was so angry, he wouldn't even give it to him. He laid it on the hood of his car. And now here he comes after me. <laughs> Already mad. And when he got to me, he said, what's your story? I said, sir, I don't have a story. I guess you weren't speeding either, were you? I said, yes, I was. And it kind of, kind of stopped him. He said, all right, you admit you were speeding. How fast were you going? I said, when I saw you, I was doing 81. What? Don't you know the speed limit is 55? And you stand here and admit you were going 81? What are we going to do about it? I said, officer, I'm going to ask you if you would find it in your heart to let me go. He said, let you go? Didn't you see me give that man a ticket for speeding and now you're saying let you go? I said, he didn't ask. I am asking. He said, but it wouldn't be just. There's that word. It wouldn't be just to give him a ticket and let you go. I said, sir, all week I've been telling sinners how God lets them go when they don't deserve it. <laughs> he said, come back here and sit in my car. Now, I didn't want to do that. I got my own car. But I was under the... Oh. It's hard when you're under the... So I went back there, and opened the door and sat down. He got in and he sort of fingered my license like this, flipping it over and over. And I'm wasting time and I looked at my watch and finally he said, Charles! I didn't like him calling me that. <laughs> That's what my wife calls me. <laughs> but I was under the he said, are you telling me you weren't speeding? You never speed? No, I didn't tell you that. I told you, however, that I didn't realize I was going that fast, and that's the truth, but I was speeding. And then he said, Charles, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> Did I deserve it? No, no, no. I deserved a ticket like that other fellow. Both of us were under the law. And justice would demand that he give us both the same ticket. But here he is saying, I'm going to let you go. The minute he said that, I thought, Grace. Grace. He said, now, the reason I had you sit in my car, he said, look out that back window. And when I looked out that window, another state trooper was giving another man a ticket. He said, I couldn't let my partner see me just stop you and let you go. Now that you're in my car, he doesn't know what I'm doing. 
This is between you and me. It always boils down to a personal relationship. You can't go on mother's part. You got to go to Jesus for yourself. He said, now, Charles, I got one last question. This is very important. I got one last question to ask you. If I let you go, do you think you can hold that big Buick down and obey the law? I said, officer, I not only think so, I promise. <laughs> he handed me my license, and he said, now, you go on and have a safe trip. I'm no longer under the law. I am under Grace. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't deserve that. But when I got out of that car, he had nothing to do with me anymore. I can go now. Nobody can condemn me. Now I'm free. I'm not under the law. He let me go. Did I deserve it? But he let me go. That's grace. Grace is unmerited favor. It is pardon which we don't deserve. And in as much as he let me go, I can ride that highway now like everybody else. I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. Isn't that clear? One last thing. Having promised him that I would go and sin no more. Don't you think having received grace I had a special obligation to obey. Huh? Now I know that's plain. I got in that car and I realized that it looked like I was going to be late. But I had respect for that man. He didn't have to let me go. I appreciated that man. He even might have risked his own job. Who knows what his partner might have made up on him. But he risked it all for me. He said, I'm going to let you go. And I felt I owed him something. And all the way home, I kept watching my speedometer and watching the speed limit. I made up my mind because he'd been good enough to let me go. I wasn't going to let him down. Now, the Apostle Paul in that same chapter goes on to let us know that Jesus died for our sins. And he lets us know that we are the recipients of special grace. And he says, now, is there something wrong with the law? No. If anybody ought to be careful to obey God, it's the one who has been forgiven for disobeying God. Would you say amen? amen. A man who's not under the law, but under grace, ought to be the most obedient of all. Many cars passed me on my way back to Maryland. They were breaking the law, but I was careful because the man had been nice to me. And I was under grace. Ladies and gentlemen, grace. We have sung about it. Joy has sung about it. When I think of grace, I see my Lord in blood-soaked Gethsemane. I see him dragged out like a common criminal, his back opened up with a cat of nine tails. I see the blood running down. I see the crown of thorns crushed on his brow, mingling blood with sweat and spit and dripping out of his bed. Grace! It wasn't cheap. Grace! He risked everything. When they hung him on the cross, I can see the vultures circling over his head. They were known to fly down to a cross and pull the eyeballs out of the victim and eat from his open wounds. I can see those wounds now filled with the gnats and flies of Palestine. Grace! And he couldn't even drive them away for his hands are fastened to a gibbet. Grace! That we might be forgiven when we don't deserve it and if we ever respected someone who was kind to us, we ought to say, Lord, I will obey you now. Because I'm not under the law. I am under grace. I am under grace. When Jesus was about to die, justice, justice demanded death. Adam should have died. Justice 
demanded that the sinner die. But when justice, standing on the periphery of God's conscience, saw Jesus die, justice cried out, It's enough! I accept it! And the Bible says, Righteousness and peace shook hands. Jesus settled the issue and gave us grace. But when Paul wrote that, he wasn't talking about all these wild, worldly sinners. He was talking about church members who had accepted grace. The letter was written to the church. I want my seven children, and I should be back on time. Thank you, Art, and thank you, Pastor Cisneros. And this is a little thing I've always done, and I always enjoy talking to intelligent audiences. And these precious little children are going to help me. Now, I'm going to name these children, and I want you to learn their names. I want to see if you can do what other audiences have done. The first one we're going to name, let's not name them. Let's just say when I point to this one, sin. What is it? Sin. Come on, everybody. What is it? Sin. Once more, sin. this one is law. Who is this? Law. Who is it? Law. Sin. This is grace. Who is this? Grace. Once more. Let's go backward. Grace, law, sin. That's very good. Let's go again. Sin, law, grace. Savior. Who is this? Savior. Savior. Come on. Savior. Now, this one is gospel. What is it? Gospel. Let's see if we can go now. Sin, law, grace, Savior, gospel. Pastor Ortiz, we got another good audience. Now let's do it all the way to the end. This is... This is preacher. Who is this? Preacher. And this one is church. What's his name? Church. church. Now, let's go and let's quote the Bible. The Bible says, who says? The Bible, the Bible says that Jesus. is the transgression of God's law. Are you with me? Yeah. Let's do it one more time. The Bible says that Jesus. is the transgression of law. Whoever hates Jesus. must uphold the law. Whoever fights the law is upholding whether he likes it or not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, grace. come on, ladies and gentlemen, grace. is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. Very good. Let's do that one more time. Grace. Is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And the Savior. die that we might have grace. which is pardoned for Sin. which is breaking the law. And gave us the, which is the good news about the Savior. Now the preaches the in his church. Now today, you've got men fighting God's law in church. And they say that the is done away with. You may go, darling. Now if you do away with the the Bible says where there is no law, there is no sin. So you may go, darling. And if you do away with sin, you don't need grace, which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And if you don't need grace, you certainly don't need a sin who died that we might have grace, which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And in that case, you don't need a because it's the story of a Savior who died that we might have grace, which is pardon for sin, which is breaking the law. And if that be true, what in the world do you need of? And if you don't need him, he might as well throw away the... Let's go quickly to the screen and see. There is grace which is valid. There is grace which is capricious tricky, which will deceive, which will destroy. It is, in other words, false grace. False grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. St. Paul was talking to church folk, saints, when he said that. I thank God for grace. Everybody would like to join me in saying that. Just say amen. amen. Without grace, we wouldn't stand a chance. Might as well close the church and go to hell. 
Grace, not works. Grace, not preaching. Grace, not singing. Grace, not teaching. Grace, not giving money. Grace saves us from our sins. Thank God for grace. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, thank God, there was grace. God promised them, I will send a Savior, somebody to die in your place. You deserve to die, but I'm going to send a Savior. Now, I'm not talking about the first death, which was a part of the penalty. But I'm talking about the second death, which forever separates man from God and from hope and from salvation and from eternal life. That's what we all desire. And way back there, as soon as sin showed its ugly face, God immediately gave a remedy. Why? Because of his love. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Adam and Eve, therefore, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Not only that, but the Bible says in Genesis 6 that Noah found grace. You know why I'm saying this? Because there are those who say grace is only the New Testament. Oh, how we mess up the Word of God. The Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's how he was able to make it. Then there was Abraham. God told him to kill his son. Abraham took his son up on Mount Moriah built an altar, raised the knife, and just as he was about to bring it down, he heard a voice saying, Abraham, Abraham, don't kill the boy. Look instead to the ram caught in the thicket. And when he turned his head and looked, he saw a ram. One writer said the ram was caught in a thorn bush. In other words, he was wearing a crown of thorns, and he could not escape. And he took that ram and slew it instead of his son. And Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. When grace comes, you ought to be glad. Would you say amen? Out there? And then there was David, king in Israel. He was a, a young boy that God had used so mightily. He took a stone in a slingshot and he let it go. And it sank into the cranium of Goliath broke through and brought him tumbling down and he took his own sword goliath's sword and hacked away its stubborn neck bones he was the champion in israel that day and yet that man became king and saw an x-rated show on a rooftop bathsheba taking a bath he lusted for her brought her to the palace and when he found out she was married had her husband sent to the front lines where he figured he'd die and die he did and he claimed her as his wife, and she bore him Solomon. What an awful sin. And his sin got out. His sin got out. One day, that man with broken heart started praying for grace. Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, O Lord, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. He didn't say, have mercy on me because I'm king. Have mercy on me because I give so much money. He said, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly of my iniquity. Forgive me of my sins. And God heard him and gave him grace. A man who took another man's wife and had him killed in battle so that he could have her. And yet God said, I so covered him with my blood that he henceforth is a man after my own heart. I read somewhere in the Bible that when David would go along, there were people who would throw rocks at him. There was a man running along the ridge of the hills, throwing rocks and uttering his maledictions. David was embarrassed and ashamed. When he looked at himself, he was ashamed. When he looked at the people, there was no encouragement. And so what must he decide? Looking at himself, ah, it'll discourage you. Looking at people, they can't help you. David said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. There is a God in heaven and a sinner can look up. David found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then that was Peter. Now you think Judas did an awful thing, and he did. But stop and think, all Judas did was kiss the Lord. And in the Middle East, they do that. 
I preached for over two months in Egypt, and every night I got kissed on both sides of the face by men. It's their custom. I didn't do any kissing, but I sure got kissed. So in that part of the world, it is not an unnatural thing. And when Judas kissed him, he said, Hail, Master. That was awful. But Peter appears to have done worse. He followed along when they brought him to the palace and, and they built a fire. And as they were arresting Jesus and abusing him, some young woman stopped and said, He's one of them. Peter said, Who? Not me. And she said, yes, he is. I've seen him with the so-called Messiah. And Peter said, I don't know the man. And when they insisted he was part of Christ's group, Peter began to curse and swear. Curse like a sailor, because that's what he was. And as he was doing it, the Lord just looked at him. And it broke his heart. One writer said, Peter ran away from that crowd, heartbroken, sobbing. He went down through the gate and across the brook Kedron into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he found the very spot where Jesus had prayed and stretched himself out there and poured out his soul, and he found grace. When Jesus rose up from the dead, he wanted to know, go tell Peter, go tell John. Go tell my disciples. But he named Peter. Grace, which he didn't deserve. This man, Peter, became one of the foremost disciples. Wasn't afraid anymore. In Acts 5, they accused him and Peter said, We ought to obey God rather than man. I'm not scared anymore. Well, what is it that made you unafraid? I was in the upper room when the Holy Ghost came. I'm not scared anymore. I lied and I cursed and I swore and, and I was an outcast, but he took me back in. I'm not scared anymore. I'm not under the law anymore. I'm under grace. And we ought to obey God rather than man. Peter found grace. The law of the Lord is what? Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's law is perfect, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I want you to follow me. I'm going to do something with these blocks up here. I want you to follow me. You can turn on radio to a religious station most any time, and you will hear people talking about saving people from their sins, right? Oh, what are you doing? I'm trying to save these sinners from their sins. Look. Follow me now. Save sinners? Save them from what? If there is no law, there is no... The Bible says that. So now you on the radio talking about saving sinners from sin and in the next breath saying the law was done away with, what are you saving them from? Thank you for saying amen. If there is no law, what are you saving them from? There is no sin where there is no law. Incredible. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. That's the New Testament. The same one who saves is the lawgiver. Would somebody say amen? amen. In New Testament. Forget dispensations. This is the New Testament. There is one lawgiver. That's Jesus. And he is able to say, you can't separate one from the other, beloved. Jesus is the lawgiver. Jesus is the Savior. They are one and the same person. And if you're going to be saved, you're being saved from sin, which is breaking the law. Where there is no law, there is no sin. And it cost him a lot to work it out for us. But he went all the way. Jesus didn't hold back for us. Oh, how he loved us. I don't understand it. 
The disciples that followed him around didn't understand it. One of them exclaimed, What manner of love is this the Father hath bestowed upon us? For adventure for a righteous man, somebody would give his life. I think I'd give my life for my wife. But while we were yet sinners, no good, bound for hell, rebellion in our hearts against God. He came and died for us. What kind of love is that? And how will you respond to that love? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace that can reach down into the gutter and save the worst of the lot. I baptized a prostitute in a large city. A prostitute, did you hear me? Baptized her. Seven years later, I was invited back to speak to those who were witnessing for Jesus. And here was this woman, a very attractive woman, and you can tell when she's looking at you. And she came running and threw herself into my arms and her hands wrapped around my neck and kissed me on the side of the face without my permission. <laughs> and then she said, you don't know me, do you? Well, let me tell you, when you start walking with Jesus, it changes the way you walk. It changes the way you talk. It combs your hair. It brushes your teeth. It cleans your house. When you become a Christian, it affects the whole life. And when I saw that prostitute, she didn't look like she used to look. Thank God. Something new was happening inside of her. Christ as her Savior lived in her heart. Her expression was joyous. Her face had flushed out. She was now a handsome person, not haggard and beaten down by her filthy trade. I said, what are you doing here? Oh, she said, I'm a soul winner. Hallelujah! Grace! Grace! Grace. Those who break God's law are under the law. That is under its condemnation. For to break the law is sin. And the wages of sin is If you break it, you're under the condemnation of it and you're bound to die. And the only remedy is grace. Grace says the blood of Jesus in the stead of the blood of the sinner. When I think of what grace has done for me, I can't help but shout tonight. He picked me up off Market Street in Greensboro, North Carolina. Took me out of a little gang I was running with. Got out a little band I played trap drums in. Took the cigarette and the beer out of my mouth. Called me into his service. Sent me off to college where I met the finest person to marry I could ever have dreamed about. Grace preached the gospel. Five continents. Men who can't even understand English sit listening and catching it through an interpreter and giving their hearts to Christ in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in South America, in Australia. Grace! And still when I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I can be lost. Grace! And it does not free me from obedience. It makes me feel, Lord, I'm willing to do anything. Not only that, he gives me power to do it through his grace. Grace. So if you hear it again, we're not under the law but under grace. 
Now you understand, don't you? And I want grace tonight. I need it in my life tonight. I need Jesus tonight. Yesterday's blessings will not suffice. He kept me today. He used me today. Kept me happy today. Kept me alive today. But I need him every day and every hour. And I sure do want to serve him. Like that state trooper in Virginia, I don't want to let him down. I plead with him. I plead with him to hold on to me. Don't let Satan take me out of your hands. Hold on to me, Lord. Don't let me make a fool out of myself now. I've come too far to turn back now. Save me, Lord. Please save me. Do you feel that way if you do stand on your feet right now? Save me, Lord. Let's say it together. Save me, Lord. Not through works, not through what we do or what we pay, but through grace. Save me, Lord. Close your eyes, please, and pray with me. We come in the name of Jesus. That sweet name. The name of one who worked it out for us. Who came down to this sin-cursed earth who bore the test who was tormented from the cradle to the tomb one who caught the spit of contempt the whip of rage the nails of the Romans pounded through his flesh in his name in his name and when Satan would accuse us we don't plead our goodness but his grace grace God's grace grace that can pardon and cleanse within grace grace marvelous grace grace that can save me from all my sins. Tonight, Lord, we in this church are thankful for Jesus. Thankful for grace. We don't deserve it. Thank you for doing it for us. Thank you for being willing to forgive, willing to cleanse, and help everyone here and in the other auditorium and all who listen to know that through Jesus Christ, every one of us here can be in the kingdom of God. And when we get up there, we're not going to talk about how much money we gave or how many good things we did. We're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. We'll cast our crowns at Jesus' feet and thank him for his grace. Save us, Lord. Save us by putting the desire in our hearts to do right. Save us by helping us to fall out of love with the world and in love with the truths of God's Word. If I have not told these people the truth, then I'm asking you to wash it out of their minds. But if I have, and I know I have, I pray that you would write it indelibly upon their hearts and whenever they would go to the right or to the left, call them back to the path of strict integrity. By grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for grace. The worst one in here can be saved by grace. The one who is ashamed right now can be set free. Even when your parents don't want you, he will take you. When the church is ready to disfellowship you, he will take you. Such is his love and such is his grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, Lord, you know it so. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. 
I see, and I see Jesus as my only hope and salvation. Lord, bless us and keep us now in his name. There is someone who cares. He'll save you if you choose. There is someone who cares, but now there's no excuse. He will save you, I said, for there is someone who cares. Do not his truth refuse, for that someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. His holy word is clear. There is someone who cares. Your soul to him is dear. There is someone who cares. His spirit draweth near. Well, that someone who cares is Jesus. Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace in your hearts. Peace in your homes.